Jacob has died. Joseph was 17 years old when he was sold off into slavery. And then he's reunited when Jacob is 130 and Jacob dies at 147. So you do the math. He has 17 years with his beloved son Joseph at the beginning of his life. And he has 17 years at the end of his life with Joseph. So this reunion, this reconciliation we saw last week happened 17 years ago, and yet the brothers are still nervous. Chapter 50, verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. Notice, they take responsibility. They understand that what they did, they did evil. Now, Joseph's going to explain once again that ultimately God had a plan in it, but they recognize we did evil. And they're thinking, even after 17 years, perhaps little brother has just been biding his time, and just for the sake of our father, that we would all pretend to be getting along on this uh, family holiday here in Egypt. But 17 years later, now we're going to get it. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And let's take the brother's word for it that they just didn't make this up out of thin air. They've been known to do that, but that Jacob actually said this. They repeat it to him. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of God, your father. So they're asking, now pleading, okay, before dad died, he wanted you to know one last time, would you please forgive us? They still have not come to believe that they fully have been forgiven, that they really have received mercy from God and from their brother. I wonder if there's people in your life who still wonder if you've really, truly forgiven them. Joseph's response, he wept. He wept when they spoke to him, perhaps weeping because he can't believe that they still are concerned about some vengeance in his heart, or perhaps weeping because they've lived for 17 years saddled with a burden they didn't need to have, but he weeps. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? It's a really good point there, Joseph, because ultimately what many of us want is to be in the place of God, to right every wrong just the way that God could do, to see the end from the beginning, to to affect some sort of cosmic justice that only God can do, to judge as only God can judge. Joseph says, I'm not God. I'm I'm not here to, to punish you. And then once again, he leans on the theological belief In providence, verse 20, as for you, you meant evil against me. That is true. They already said in verse 15, we did evil. They were responsible. God's sovereignty does not remove their human responsibility. They sinned. You meant evil, but God meant it for good. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. Now notice, as I've said before, it does not simply say what you meant for evil, God turned for good. That would be amazing. Some of us think of God's sovereignty like that. Well, we sort of mess things up, and then God swoops in, and he says, okay, I can clean up this mess. You know, mom coming home after dad's been in charge of the kids for a while. All right, all right, you made a mess of things, but I know how to put things back into order. That's not what it says. God's sovereignty is much bigger than that. It doesn't say he figured it out and fixed it. It says all the while you meant evil, God was doing something different. Through all of that, God meant something good. So don't be afraid. We see God's sovereign hand leading Joseph once again to this place of supreme compassion and mercy. We also see God's sovereignty or his providence back in the blessing of Ephraim instead of Manasseh, the switcheroo with the hands. 
Joseph says, whoa, 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 dad, hold on a minute. I know you're old. You don't see very well. And we can excuse Joseph for thinking that Jacob is making a mistake. After all, remember, it was Jacob's father, Isaac, when he was old and he was blind, who mistakenly gave the blessing to Jacob instead of Esau. So Joseph's going, whoa, we've seen this movie before. Old man, dad, can't see straight, gives the blessing to the wrong son. But Jacob makes clear he intentionally means to bless the younger instead of the older. Though failing in his sight, Jacob sees more clearly than ever before. Isn't it true that throughout this book, we see God's grace is sovereign and free? This is why when people come to the, sometimes called the doctrines of grace, it can feel like a second conversion. And why people rebuff against it because it is so free. And yet when you come to embrace it, you come to see something essentially true about God. That he alone sovereignly dispenses his mercy as he sees fit. Praise be to God. What we see throughout Genesis is that God's grace does not have to align with those we think naturally, quote unquote, deserve it. The blessing was so often given to those who could not claim it as any sort of right. Abraham, who's he? Well, he's a pagan idolater in Ur of the Chaldees. Why should God call him? Well, because God likes to do things like that. Isaac, a miraculous child, he shouldn't even be there. Jacob is a schemer, a deceiver, the younger son. Ephraim is the younger. Judah is the worst of the lot of them. And God over and over again says, I'll dispense my grace as I see fit. So there's a warning here for any of us who presume to be on top, who feel like I'm kind of doing it in life. I'm kind of making it. Look at where I live. Look at the money that I make, the job that I have. Anyone who feels like you're on top, now we see a number of rich, well-to-do people follow Jesus. It's not that you can't do it, but there's a danger in thinking that this thing that we sing about called grace, deep down you feel like, yeah, you kind of deserve this grace. If you think that, it ain't grace. There's a warning against presumption and there's also a hope for anyone who's at the bottom. Anyone here poor in spirit, I absolutely don't deserve anything from God. I have so messed up everything in my life. I've never got anything straight. If people knew who I really was and what's really going on and where I've really been this week on my computer and in my thoughts and with my sight, nobody would think anything of me. God says, that's the sort of heart I love to bless. It's a reminder about who is God and who is not. Blessing comes always by grace. And sometimes God's ways confound us and do not match our desires or the way we think things ought to work. Look back at chapter 48, verse 18. Joseph said to his father, not this way, my father. Since this one is the firstborn, put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He shall also become a people, and he shall also be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his offspring shall become a multitude of nations. Can you see there in verses 18 and 19 the anguished heart in so many of God's people. How many of us at some time in our life have wanted to say to God, and, it's not, and it may not even be out of anger, it may be out of just profound grief, exactly what Joseph said to his father, not this way, my father. Ever said that to God? Not this way, my father. Why, why would you do it this way? This isn't the way I asked for. This isn't the way things are done. This is not the best way. You, you got something mixed up here. 
And then our Heavenly Father says to us, just as Jacob says to Joseph, he doesn't rebuke him. Jacob's become a tender father. He says with a loving voice of a loving dad, I know, my son, I know. I know this isn't the way you want it to be. I know this isn't the way things are usually done. I know that this is confusing to you and it doesn't make sense. I know all that, my son, I love you. And I'm telling you that I know what I'm doing. And I have a plan. Reminds us who God is and who we are not. And though his ways confound us and do not always match our desires, yet we can trust, as Joseph says at the very end of the book, that God means for good, even what we may think is for evil. Which leads to the final theme, faith. Look back at chapter 47. We've seen several times throughout the book in different sections, our book ended. And we see this here at the end of Jacob's life. There's a book ended request that he would be buried in Canaan. Look at chapter 47, verse 29. And when the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, put your hand under my thigh and promise to deal kindly and truly with me. Do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. Carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. He answered, I will do as you have said. And he said, swear to me. And he swore to him. Then Israel bowed himself upon the head of his bed. And then turn to the end of chapter 49. We see again, as he's just ready to breathe his last, he makes this request one more time. Chapter 49, verse 29. Then he commanded them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite in the cave that is in the field at Machpelah, to the east of Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. There I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is in it were brought from the Hittites. When Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. This is a request of profound faith. Jacob is a man who has been transformed. Who is his beloved wife? Rachel. We read back in chapter 48 that Rachel died on the way to Ephrath, that is on the way to Bethlehem. She is not buried in that cave that Abraham bought for Sarah, the cave in Machpelah, But Jacob says, don't bury me in Egypt. You bury me back in Canaan, in the tomb of my fathers, the one piece of land that we have deed to in the whole promised land. What do they have at this point in their history? They have a grave and a cave. That's all they have. And Jacob says, I want to be buried there. Yes, where Leah is buried. He understood that he belonged in Canaan more than he belonged with Rachel. A profound act of faith. And the goal of Genesis is that we would be a people of faith. Look at the very end of the book. It may seem somewhat anticlimactic, but there's more here than meets the eye. Verse 22, Joseph remained in Egypt in his father's house. Joseph lived 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation, the children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. This may just seem like wrapping up the lives of the patriarchs. After all, four-fifths of Genesis covers the lives of just four people. You get the first 11 chapters, which sweep through on an epic scale thousands of years. And then the rest of the book, just four people. 
Abraham lived to be 175, Isaac to 180, Jacob to 147, Joseph to 110. But don't think that this is just about family history. This is about faith. And just like theirs, our faith will be struggling, growing, changing, imperfect, sometimes stumbling. But we must have faith that God can do and will do what he promised for his people. Although I said there are four of these lessons here, the singular lesson that's drawn for us in the book of Hebrews is that Genesis is a book of faith. That famous chapter in Hebrews 11, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. In Hebrews 11, there are 36 verses commending to us the faith of God's ancient people, 36 verses. 20 of those verses hearken back to Genesis, 7 to Exodus, 9 to the rest of the Old Testament. 20 of the 36 go to Genesis. So for the author of Hebrews, Genesis is the example supremely of being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. By faith, God created the world, seen out of what was unseen. By faith, we read of Abel. By faith, we read of Enoch. By faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Sarah. By faith, Isaac. And then in Hebrews 11, we come to Jacob and Joseph. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. You see, with each of them, as the end of Hebrews 11 tells us, all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Since God had provided something better for us that apart from us, they should be made perfect. Have you ever noticed the very last word in Genesis? This is the last word in English and it's the last word in Hebrew. It's an ominous word, Egypt. So this whole story, this magnificent story in the first book of the Bible and the very last word for God's people but they're in Egypt. They're not in the promised land. They're but 70 people. They haven't grown into a great nation. They haven't seen the people fill the entire earth. They're not enjoying the land of Canaan. They end the book in Egypt because faith is believing what we cannot see. And so they'll take the bones of Jacob back. We read that in chapter 50. But then they return to Egypt. And it will be another 450 years before they can come back with the bones of Joseph. At this point, at the end of Genesis, all they have is a cave and a grave. And they have to trust God for all that is yet to come. But did you notice Joseph's final words before he dies? Twice, he says, God will visit you. God will visit you in 24 and 25 because he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And so surely, though I'm about to die, God will visit you. And Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you. This is important language. It's Joseph's way of saying, I'm about to die, but God is coming. His blessing is on its way, and he will visit you. You don't see it yet, but blessing is coming. You ever notice every major section in Scripture ends this way? We see it here in Genesis We see it at the end of the Pentateuch in Deuteronomy 34. The Lord said to Moses, this is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to your offspring. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. There it is, Moses. But you don't have it yet. 
It's the way that the whole Old Testament ends. Malachi 4 announces, the day of the Lord is coming. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great, awesome day of the Lord. So between the Old and the New Testament is a promise. God will visit you. You, you, You're not there yet. And it's the way the whole Bible ends. Revelation 22, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen, come Lord Jesus. God will visit you. Faith is to be certain of the things that we do not yet see. And it's the lesson of Genesis, the lesson of the Pentateuch, it's the lesson of the Old Testament, it's the lesson of all the Bible. Can you believe for all that you do not now see that God will visit you? And though you may be in the land of Egypt, he will soon bring you home to the land of Canaan. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we give thanks for your word, for all that we have seen in your holy and inerrant word through these studies in Genesis. And so we pray, O oh Lord, that you would bless us We need you every hour, and we pray for your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen.